All right, folks, in this video, we're going to take a look at the MFJ 2012 All Center Fed Dipole. I did want to say before we get started that there is some background noise. My 3D printer is going off here at uh, Smoking Ape Studios. We're constantly printing off devices that make ham radio easier and more accessible to me, most importantly, but maybe to some viewers as well. Anyhow, there are some buttons down below, a like button, a comment button, a subscribe button. Go ahead and click them. It'll make you happy. All right, folks, so here is the MFJ 2012, the Powerlight Off-Center Fed Dipole. Before we get started, I did want to say that I was contacted by MFJ, and they asked if I would do a video review of this particular product. Of course, I said yes, so they sent it to me free of charge in exchange for this video review. Let's go ahead and see what's inside. One thing I really like about MFJ products is they ship in these durable bags, and it makes it easy for storage, and it also makes it easy for transport in the event that I wanted to take this antenna portable. It's a little big, it's a little bulky. I'm not real sure that I would consider this a portable antenna, but you could certainly use it that way if you didn't mind carrying it around. We'll go ahead and take a look at the manual that is online. This comes in all MFJ products now. You have the phone number to contact them, but uh, really it just says your manual is online and then here's the online website, which is fine by me because we're killing less trees. So when you take a look at this antenna, one of the things that uh, I'm going to say is, is that this is very durable feeling uh, copper wire. It is not insulated. And then at the end of each wire, you have these ceramic insulators that are crimped on here. If you didn't need to make an adjustment to this antenna, it would be a little bit difficult with this particular crimp that's on here. So let's hope we don't. Being an all-center fed dipole, one side of the, uh, of the antenna where the center conductor uh, that goes through your coax is connected is about 66% of the total length with the shorter side being about 33%. The overall length of this antenna, I'm going to estimate at about 66 feet, but we'll see when we take a look at the manual. When handling this antenna, you really want to be careful not to bend or kink this wire. It feels like hard drawn copper. Uh, it's very, very rigid. And if you got a kink in there, it would be difficult to get out. Here you can see your coax connector and then uh, where the antenna uh, comes out of this magic box. Now I believe this is some sort of four to one on We're gonna take it open. We're gonna open it up and we're gonna take a look and see what kind of magic's inside um, to figure out what it, uh, exactly is in there. But then whatever this device is inside comes back out and that's where you have your antenna elements connected. You have some of these holes here and uh, I believe you use zip ties or string to, to mount this antenna up. Then you have some weeping holes here um, in the event that you get moisture build up inside your ballon. Uh, taking a quick look at it, this box does not appear to be uh, weatherproof. So what I would do if I was going to hang this up outside is, is I would run a silicon bead around this and then I would mount it in a way where this is the side that hangs up and then your coax here comes down. I did want to mention that when you put your coax on here, there is no strain relief for your coax. You might be able to rig, rig something up with some zip ties, but in this configuration, I don't see any strain relief or stress relief for your coaxial cable. I did decide to connect this right angle adapter to the uh, housing, and that way it should help me out when I mount this on my mast. Now, it wouldn't be a smoke and ape video without a little bit of internet. So here we are at the MFJ Enterprises website. And you can see they have a number of off-center fed dipole antennas. So in the search results, the first one we have is the 2012, and that's the one that we're reviewing today. It's for 20, 40, 10, and 6 meters, and it says it's rated for up to 1.5 kilowatts. It's called the Power Light, and it sells for $89.95. Here you can see the 2016, and this one is for 75 and 160 meters, 1,500 watts. And it's a little bit more pricey. Uh, I would imagine that this is a big boy and is uh, is quite long. They have the 2013, which covers 30 and 60 meters. It's uh, 300 watts. And then they have the uh, 2014, which is 75 and 40 meter dual band, all center fed dipole. Um, here it says 1500 watts. And then they have the MFJ 2010, which is like the 2012 that we're reviewing, uh, except for it's only rated at 300 watts and it is a quad band antenna. Let's go up here and uh, let's take a look and see what, uh, what, what kind of information we can find out. 
So when you take a quick look at this, it uh, says that it's rated for uh, 1500 watts. It says it is a robust high power version of the 2010. We just talked about that. Uh, 14 gauge stranded copper wire and porcelain ends insulators. I thought they were ceramic. I don't know what the difference is between porcelain and ceramic. Um, it talks about being the high, high efficiency, best match, and it's got a super balance in there. And we're going to pop this baby open and see what that looks like. Uh, it says off-center fed dipoles need good balance to block feed line radiation. Built-in bifilar, I think is how you say that. Wound guanella current choke has over 30 dB of common mode noise rejection in all bands. Kills pattern irregularities, RFI noise. It says it delivers a 6 dBi uh, ground reinforced dipole pattern on the fundamental and a 9 dBi full wave clover leaf on the second harmonic. Um, element feed points are compensated for typical mounting height, so I always want to get the lowest possible SWR in all bands. And it has some frequency compensation in there. Um, this is for uh, 80 meters, which ours does not do. So this is probably ad copy from uh, the other antenna. It says installs in a flat top or inverted V setup. We're going to set ours up as an inverted V. Feed block has attachment feed point or has attachment points for tower or tree support. Suggested height is 35 to 70 feet. Ours is going to be mounted at about 30 feet, give or take. Low cost outperforms multiband vertical antennas by a wide margin for an unbelievable fraction of the cost. Let's take a look and see what we have in here in terms of a product manual. So here's the manual for the MFJ 2012. And here's the disclaimer telling you not to do anything crazy or dumb. Uh, here's an introduction, mostly of what we talked about before. Installing feed lines as using any 50 ohm coax cable is consistent with your station's output power, RG58 or RG8X. We're going to be using uh, RG8X. It's good for low power operation up to 100 watts, but RG8 for low loss equivalent such as Bedlin. Uh, 9914 is strongly recommended with running legal limit amplifier. So here it says uh, for general installation, it's 67 feet long, which is the same length as a 40 meter dipole. Recommended mounting height is between 30 and 70 feet above the ground. So it's a little different than what we just read. Uh, here it goes through the power rating and it shows the SWR. Now what I wanted to mention real quick is a lot of times people buy an antenna and like, oh, that antenna sucks. I don't like that antenna. Or, or they'll buy an antenna and say, oh, well, this antenna is fantastic. There's a lot of things that go into your antenna system. And I was actually just talking with this, uh, talking about this with some buddies last night. Um, your height above ground definitely plays a factor into the impedance in point, uh, the impedance at the feed point of your antenna where your coax plugs into the ballon in this case. And uh, also the ground composition makes a, makes a big impact on that as well. So I could buy an antenna that works great, but if I mount it too high, I mount it too low, I mount it over bad ground, I could have problems. And that's my problem. That's not a problem with the antenna. So I do want to point that out. Um, here, as mentioned, they show a couple of different uh, plot patterns for SWR. And we're going to hook ours up to an NOVNA and we're going to do some, uh, some plots ourselves. But this is with a RG8X cable with the antenna mounted 45 feet above ground. So again, I'm mounting mine at about 30 feet. So I should not expect to see these particular SWR patterns. Uh, here they show some of the patterns in gain. And you can see that uh, 40 meters looks pretty good. 20 meters is that cloverleaf pattern that I mentioned earlier. And 10 and 6, you start to get this porcupine looking pattern thing. Uh, I'm mostly concerned about 40 and 20 meters. They're the bands that I operate on the most. If I got 30, and maybe I will with the use of my tuner, I'll be extra happy. But I'm really mostly concerned with 40 and 20 for this, uh, this antenna. Here's some information about their limited 12-month warranty. And uh, it, most of these manuals will normally say something. Uh, maybe it's under the 12-month warranty. Here we go. This warranty is not void for owners who attempt to repair defective units. And I think that's awesome. I really appreciate that MFJ allows you to work on devices that are sent to you in the event that they don't work for you and you want to modify them a little bit uh, without voiding your warranty. That's really handy. All right, let's go back to the tabletop. Okay, here we've opened up our Ballon device. And uh, you can see that it has a number of components. We removed four screws from the housing in order to expose the internals. On the left, you can see that there is a one-to-one -one current choke uh, or ballon choke, as some folks may call that. It's got about 12 wraps of Teflon-coated magnetic wire um, to reduce CMC or common mode current from coming down the feed line. And then you have two cylindrical ferrite beads that have a number of wrappings that go through that. 
I was very curious as to how this was interconnected, so I broke out a multimeter, in this case the Anang AN8008. And people might ask, why did you use that multimeter ape? And I used that one because it's the one I had on hand. Now, I was under the impression that the shorter element was connected to the shield. And so when I started to do these tests, what I quickly realized is that we have continuity between both elements, which had me scratching my head a little bit. So I continued to do more continuity tests. And what I discovered was that out of the current ballon, there were uh, two solder joints. Each one of those solder joints had two connections to it. One of those uh, was interconnecting the shield and the coax together, which is why we had continuity across both elements. The others were run to the radiating elements themselves. So um, it was pretty interesting and basically reflecting on some previous four to one ballon designs I had read in the past, I did realize that uh, this is how it's done. So we're gonna take a quick look at a schematic that I found on the internet and compare it to this. Now my apologies up front for the blurriness of this graphic, but it's the best that I could find on the internet. And I didn't record where I found it. So I can't give credit to whoever uh, did this documentation. I'm pretty sure they weren't the original designer of the circuit anyway. So on the left, you can see we have a 50 ohm input that comes in and it goes through our RF choke, uh, represented by RFC1. And then you can see that splits off and then goes between those two cylindrical ferrite beads that we looked at earlier. And you can also see the interconnection of the wire, which bridges the shield and the coax layers. And then all the way to the right, you can see your 200 ohm output, 50 in, uh, 200 out. And that is what they call one to four or going the other direction, a four to one ballon. It's actually a pretty clever design. Uh, and I'm really interested in testing this out and playing around with it a little bit more. So here's how we have the antenna attached to the mast. I have a hook at the top of the mast and I'm using a zip tie configuration uh, to the matchbox itself. And then uh, we have the coax that runs up behind it. And then that is zip tied to the mast to act as strain or stress relief. From a side angle, you can see the stress relief on the coax cable, plus the 90 degree right angle that I used uh, as the attachment to the, to the PL239, 259, something like that adapter. Um, next thing we're going to do is we're going to get this up in the air and see what it looks like. So right off the bat, you can see that the antenna is in an inverted V configuration. The shorter leg of the dipole is a little tighter, a little closer to the pole than the longer leg. Uh, I don't know if that's going to cause a problem or not. It'll certainly adjust the radiation pattern a little bit, but I think we're going to be okay. The other thing I wanted to mention is, is that we're about 25 to 27 feet up. Uh, not the recommended 40 feet or 30 plus that I was hoping for. So I'm a little concerned that that is going to impact or affect the SWR matching a little bit. We're going to test and find out. I hooked up my Nano VNA, calibrated it, and uh, we're using Nano VNA Saver on my Linux Mint laptop. Check out my Nano VNA playlist if you want to get some experience or some ideas how to use that. So the results that we got on the sweep were pretty interesting. If you take a look, uh, I ran it from 40 to 10 meters, and you see dips at each one of those showing the harmonics of the resonant cut, which is the 40 meter length. The antenna is actually a little resonant past the 40 meter band, as you can see if you look at the left side of the graph. And uh, I, I think that some of that has to do with the way the antenna is mounted. It's a little low and the V is a little tight. I think if you flatten that out a little bit, uh, you're going to see that come over to the right just a little bit. I don't know how that would impact the harmonics on the other bands. But uh, 40, just barely at the end of the, t or the, uh, the higher end of the band, we get up to around two, two to one SWR. We look pretty good on 10 and 20, so I don't have any worries there. Um, we're also going to take a look at six meters, and that is coming up right here. So in taking a look at this, I think it's pretty safe to assume that uh, as it stands or as it's installed, uh, the antenna is not usable on the six meter band which is understandable. Like I said, my uh, installation of the antenna is uh, what I would call a pretty significant compromise. Could be a little bit higher, a little bit flattened or flattened out a little bit more. But uh, the antenna works fine on uh, uh, 40 through 10. Uh, specifically, what I'm interested in is 40 and 20, and uh, that, that's what I'm most excited about. Uh, I was able to make some contacts, and I'm very happy with the antenna. 
this is the part of the video when I thank everybody for watching. And I thank MFJ for sending me this antenna for my consideration. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to respond. Once again, I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.